Aloha and welcome to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to walk towards a clean and just energy future. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. Today, we'll look at how community planning is important to climate adaptation and energy justice. Hawaii's mandate to reach 100% clean and renewable energy is important for many reasons. It's important for the environment and the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Perhaps more important, however, is the need for the islands to end its dependence on imported oil and improve both the energy affordability and energy security of Hawaii. As we move towards a clean energy future, there's an emphasis on distributed clean energy generation, like rooftop solar and community solar. Now, as energy assets transform and spread throughout our communities, it's more important than ever that energy customers have input on how energy decisions are made. Further, communities need to make these decisions in the context of the threats posed by climate change. This climate change will mean increasing temperatures and increasing incidence of severe weather events. So today, we will learn how advocates in New York are doing cutting edge work to engage communities in climate adaptation. We will also discuss work being done in Hawaii to include communities in energy planning. I am joined in the studio by Sean Aronson. Hello and welcome, Sean. <laughs> Sean is a student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Richardson Law School. He's focusing on environmental law with a specialization in property and land use, as well as energy policy, and is a participant in the Energy Justice Clinic at the law school. He also has degrees in anthropology and documentary filmmaking. Welcome, Sean. Thank you, Raya. Thanks for having me here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Excellent. Yeah. You're very, very welcome. Now, I am also joined via Skype by Araj Kaurzad. Arash is an urban planner working and living in New York City. His practice is focused on the democratization of urban planning and development processes. He currently works as a policy coordinator at We Act for Environmental Justice, based in New York City, and as a lecturer on urban planning at the New School at the City University of New York. And, excuse me, at the New School and at the City University of New York. Recent projects of his include the Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan, Waycount, a tool for community-based transportation planning, and the redevelopment of the 135th Street Marine Waste Transfer Station, among others. So this is someone who is deeply involved in community planning and environmental justice. Arash has a degree in urban studies and a master's in urban and regional planning. Welcome, Arash. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. So I am so pleased that you're both here today and um, we're talking about what I think is an increasingly important issue, which is how can communities be involved in decisions that directly affect them as we transform our energy systems and also um, face climate change. So I'm so pleased to have you both here. Um, and Arash, I'm gonna ask a question. I'm gonna start with you. Could you please just go ahead and let us know? Oh, actually, let me back up. If you could introduce yourself and tell us about We Act for Environmental Justice and the work that you do. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, congratulations on your show, and we're happy to be joining you from New York. Uh, the organization I work for is, goes by the name of We Act for Environmental Justice, as you mentioned. Uh, they're a very historic and important organization within the environmental movement and within New York City, too. And that's because they were the first environmental justice organization in New York. We've been doing community-based work in northern Manhattan in broader New York City for about 25 plus years. Um, and you know, the organization and the community members that the organization is comprised of, which we'll talk about more later, have really led the way in doing participatory research, legislative advocacy, uh, you know, citizen science, direct action, all of the different approaches and tools that are necessary to create greater social equity and how we all experience environmental impacts are things that we act has been working on for many years and you know has led the way in developing um, and, and we do that primarily in New York City. All right thank you so much for sharing um, uh, information about we act. And would you like me to go on in terms of the the work that we're doing now? Um, Arash.
All right. So I think we are going to go to a quick break, and we'll return with Arash and Sean and talk about community adaptation and um, energy justice. you doing? I'm Gordo the Texar here on Think Tech Hawaii where we co-host Hibachi Talk where we talk about technology and bring in all kinds of cool guests. Also my co-host with me today is Andrew, Andrew, the, the, Andrew the security guy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii and thanks for watching Hibachi Talk. We also have Angus. Hello there lad. It's Angus. I bring in all kinds of wee things. Oh look you see my lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and welcome back to Power Up Hawaii. So, um, we had just heard from Arash talking about the work of We Act for Environmental Justice. So, Sean, if you could please um, tell us a bit about the environmental, uh, sorry, the Energy Justice Clinic at, uh, at UH Richardson Law School. Yeah, sure. So, um, so very much, uh, I would say, differently than, than um, Arash. Ours is a very new organization. And so, I am in my, um, third year of law school and the program started in my first year so it's oh, less okay. than three years old and um, the goal was kind of filling a void we didn't see um, our professor Shalanda Baker and um, other students really didn't see this work being done by any other group that was specifically targeting um, communities in Hawaii on energy justice planning and so um, you know the classic when you can't when you don't have a group to join you might as well start your own and so we have been working with um, communities on this island and then also communities in other islands and other parts of the state. Um, our first project was with the North Shore of Oahu, and we did some community energy planning workshops around um, the merger and what was going on with our utility. And then most recently, we've done some work on the island of Molokai. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, great. It is fantastic to know that there is this work is happening um, in Hawaii in a real way. Um, so we're going to go back to Arash. Yeah, sure, yeah. And I'd like to ask you, can you tell us what is community adaptation planning and why it is important? Um, absolutely. Well, WEAC has been working since uh, January 2015 on creating a community-based plan for Northern Manhattan. And for people who are familiar with New York City, Northern Manhattan includes the communities of Harlem, Washington Heights, and Inwood. It's about 500,000 people, uh, a wide range of um, ethnicities, races, uh, income groups, you know, very diverse place, and also a place that's very vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Uh, because it's, it, you know, there's a lot of coastline um, there are a lot of heat islands and there are a lot of social issues which are compounded by those environmental impacts and that's what we act works on is is uh, helping for, for people to understand the connection between those social issues and climate change or an environmental impacts and to make sure that those impacts don't have a disproportionate in, um, outcome on low-income communities of color uh, and in terms of uh, community adaptation planning you know there's an environmental justice aspect to every environmental justice issue, um, and the climate change is no different. And you know, environmental justice is an, is a reason is an issue in New York because the public sector has not implemented the necessary policies to make sure that um, certain demographic groups, as we've been discussing. Uh, aren't severely impacted. And so um, in terms of doing community adaptation planning, it's about community members coming together, talking about uh, the, the issues that they know very well, doing that in collaboration with the scientific community who can, under, who can help communicate what the long-term impacts of climate change will be, and trying to get a comprehensive picture of what the future of any specific area will look like. Uh, and to take the steps necessary to make sure that, you know, whether it's flooding, whether it's increasing temperatures, whether it's increasing, you know, the increased likelihood of blackouts or any other outcome that we can expect to happen more frequently and more severely as a result of climate change, you know, making sure that we're doing everything we can to adapt to those changes and to mitigate them and to become resilient to them so we can bounce back quicker 
and we don't experience a greater amount of suffering because of what these changes will inflict on us. And there's all kinds of tools and techniques that you can use to do that, and, and we can talk about that more. Yeah, actually, let me um, continue with you. Could you tell us a bit about the work that you're doing in New York City with climate adaptation planning? Sure. Um, so this is a process that we started uh, in early January. Uh, we act a membership-based organization, and, and so you know we've been working with several hundred people on a very regular basis leading up to this. And we continue to engage those people within this climate change adaptation and resilience process. You know, we focus more on the concept of resilience, uh, which is uh, creating an environment that's strong enough to absorb shocks that occur to it from the outside. That's the technical definition. We always add an environmental justice focus, and so we want to make sure that certain communities are resilient, communities that don't have a lot of resources, communities that are very vulnerable to those impacts. Uh, and, and that's who our membership is comprised of. Those are the people we engage in this process. We started out by doing something called scenario planning, which is to simply work collaboratively with the scientific community and with other quote unquote experts, people who have done a certain amount of research on the subject to help us understand, well, what, what will the impact of climate change be? You know, what, if there is another Sandy and it happens at high tide this time instead of low tide, wow, what would yeah. that mean community? If there is a blackout, how would that affect us? If temperatures do go up three, four degrees and there's five heat waves one year instead of three heat waves like there were this year, what would that mean for us? And to, to, to talk about that, to have a discussion as a community about what those impacts will be, and then to more importantly, come up with a plan that utilizes all of the social capital that we have within the community to deal with those impacts. Uh, and that, that's, how, that, that's what our process is focused on, and that's how we develop something called the Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan, which is a comprehensive plan to, to create resilience. And, and that's what we've been working on implementing since we developed it last year. Oh, th excellent. That sounds like really interesting um, and important work. Um, Sean, if you could, I know you started by telling us some of the work that you've done um, on the North Shore, but if you could tell us a bit about some of the work that the clinic has been doing. Um, yeah, sure. Audience. Yeah, no problem. Um, again, so we started this work back in uh, about 2014, 2015. So it's been going on about a year or two. And, um, you know, we were really looking at areas that may have been under um, represented in politics and in different areas here on the island. And the North Shore community has always been a very active community politically, but they were dealing with um, some they have had um, the highest proportion of wind turbines on the island mm. and so they were very concerned that they might be um, dealing with future wind turbines which you know they people support but they wanted to have that community discussion going forward because they felt like they weren't included the last times and so we came up with a plan um, to hold some community meetings so we hold we held three community meetings um, all within about uh, about a month of each other. And they were in three different parts of the North Shore, which is kind of a, a geographically diverse area and, and also um, ethnically diverse area. And we wanted to make sure we captured all those different um, diversities within our, our working groups. And so we worked in those groups and they were very um, collaborative. They were very, you know, we gave a brief introduction of kind of the landscape of Hawaii energy law and energy policy. Which is which is takes years to understand. So, but we tried to. We wanted everybody to not feel like they didn't have the information that maybe other people did. So that was really important to empower them with at least a basic understanding of energy law or energy um, policy here. And uh, and then we had small groups, small working groups, and we just talked things out. You know, what is your what are your priorities? Is it money? Is it um, environmentalism? Is it uh, you know security? All these different issues we tried to get out on the table and then come forward with some kind of consensus. And, and then what we were able to do was report that um, those findings to the Public Utilities Commission. Oh, excellent. That's really interesting. Yeah. And I would like to come back to that yeah. and hear more about it. Um, I also want to ask Arash, you know, since we're talking about community planning for uh, 
you know, for climate adaptation and resilience, and you mentioned that blackouts are also a part of that. So how do, how do energy issues, if at all, fit into the work that you're doing, Arash? And I know that there's other work that we Act for Environmental Justice does on this topic, too. Uh, energy is a critical part of our planning process. Um, it, it's something that New York is focusing a lot on. As many of you are aware, after Hurricane Sandy happened, uh, over 20% of New York was actually without power. And that created more of a crisis for many people than the actual storm did. Um, so for people who didn't, who, uh, you know, weren't impacted by the flooding, they still had a really hard time readjusting afterwards because they didn't have access to power. Uh, and this also occurred at, at a more frequent rate in places where there's a lot of public housing in places where there's a lot of old infrastructure and older housing, and that includes a lot of affordable housing. Uh, so so that, that was something that happened after Sandy, and that was a big wake-up call for people. And so New York has focused a lot on energy as a result of that. Um, and a lot, of the rep, the, a lot of the resources, which is over a billion dollars, that, were, that was going to be put back into uh, redeveloping infrastructure that was damaged by Sandy is now going to renewable energy, distributed renewable energy sources. Mm. Uh, and that's something that we are working on developing within Northern Manhattan. Um, it's important for that reason, but equally important are the economic reasons that are associated with our energy infrastructure. Um, there's, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, it's maybe a trillion dollar industry, globally speaking. Uh, it's something that can provide educational opportunities. It's something that can provide job opportunities. And it's something that can provide cost savings, uh, which are very important for, for people uh, in the city. And, you know, it's, it's good to be here with you because I think that, you know, Hawaii has the most expensive energy in the country and New York is right up there with it. Mm -hmm. It's second mm -hmm. or something like That's that. Exactly so, right. you know, as, as you know, many people experience something called energy poverty um, and they, they either don't have access to reliable energy or they're paying too much for the energy that they get access to. They're paying a higher percentage of their income for energy than other people are. And so for us, you know, we want to not only get off of fossil fuels so we can reduce carbon emissions and uh, mitigate global warming, but we want to make sure that everybody's included in that transition. And that's what you hear referred to as the just transition. It's not good enough just to transition to renewable energy. You have to do it in a way that helps build a new economy that helps reduce inequality. And that, that's really the kind of environment and the kind of society that we want. So that's, that's something that we're working on. And we're, we're doing that primarily through something called community shared solar. And community shared solar allows the development of rooftop solar which in New York, you know, New York City has buildings everywhere. There's not a lot of open spaces, so we need a lot of rooftop solar. A solar could generate a good percentage, 15, 20%, something like that, of the power consumed by New York City. So it's, it could be a reliable source, and community shared solar allows for anyone in the city to subscribe to a solar panel or a set of solar panels that are located on any rooftop within the region. And so that would get a lot of people access to solar who, who don't have access to their own rooftop. And that's something that yeah, we're that's, doing. Now. It's actually, that's, that's fantastic that you mentioned that. We actually, on the last Power Up Hawaii, well, the week before last, we had Jorge Madrid from the Environmental Defense Fund talking about community solar as it's happening in California. And I'm just, I'm really glad that you mentioned it because I think that next to California, Hawaii and New York, I think, are New York probably a bit out ahead in terms of we're here we're just still developing some of the tariffs but are, are working on that issue mm -hmm. and i'm also very glad arash that you brought up the high energy prices both here mm -hmm. and yeah. in new york which really creates an economic imperative um for energy justice um and reducing energy costs um let me go back let me go yeah. back to you sean and i if you could talk a little bit more about what it's like actually gathering the information mm. from the community um, and what happens then when, you know, and how do you make that link to the policy makers or the intended audience or stakeholders? And who are those intended audience and stakeholders? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that was a, you know, a, a particular challenge for us, you know, 
getting the information and gathering people was not easy, but it, generally people were engaged with this information and, and we were happy with the turnout at our events and, and, the, and the level of, of awareness and, and energy that people brought to the table. And I think, you know, just for people who may be watching outside of Hawaii, you know, we were engaged in this very intense takeover, you know, buyout or merger of our utility, which ended up not succeeding. Um, but that allowed a, a real heavy spotlight on energy, I think, that maybe hadn't been there before. So, so we were happy with the engagement, but of course we knew that our information would only be as effective as the people we could get it to, like you said. Who are the stakeholders? Um, and, you know, we definitely were most focused on the PUC at that point, the Public Utilities Commission, because they getting, were making this decision. Getting impact from the people directly into the process, that the yeah. decision-making process yeah, that Yeah, I think happening. we felt like, you know, um, they're asking for community input, but not everybody's going to write testimony. You know, the traditional ways in which a, a, a citizen may contribute in this process um, we were trying to come to them a little bit more than, than them having to come to the table, which is a lot to ask for. Do you feel like you had an impact? Did you, what were, did you feel like you were heard and, and what type of feedback did you get through yeah. that process? Did you know, you, were I you mentioned in decisions the commission made? Were there, were there press conferences? Sure, yeah. I, I don't think we got any shout outs in the, in the DNO or anything. Um, but, uh, but I do think, you know, there was, stakeholders outside the PUC who did tell us that, that they think our work um, was important and, and did, you know, again, I think it was this idea of getting everybody on an even playing field because um, I think, you know, um, Arash talked about a just transition and I think that's really, really the key here in Hawaii because we have this 100% mandate. We know we got to get there. We know we probably will get there, but it's that pathway. And we could take many pathways that allow a same kind of economic system and the same few people to benefit from that system or we can choose a different path as we head towards renewables and um, and I think that's still being worked out in here in Hawaii I think there's a lot of people who are pushing that way but um, but it we're, we're not nearly where where I think New York is in California in terms of making sure that those those community groups um, are at the table and do have an impact and so i think this was one step in that process and i think our yeah. we were happy with that first initial step yeah, but gotta, but there's a lot more work to go it sounds like a you know a new clinic was opportunistic in um seeking opportunities to have an impact let me ask you arasha similar question what's it like when you know how do you put and i know that you've got a lot of experience with community-based action tools so how when you how do you get this information from the community and then how do you figure it out to get to how to get it to the stakeholders and who are the stakeholders who need to get it yeah that's that's a good uh really good question and i think it's something that everybody needs to be asking themselves who are doing community work because it's different everywhere and it's really important to have a process that is inclusive of everyone uh, for us it means um having people that are a part of our organization who are from the community you know first and foremost you want to you want to make sure that you're engaging people that are representative um, or not just representative but can speak directly to the issues going on um, and you have a thorough extensive engagement with them you know they're they're part of a process where there can be educational opportunities for everyone um, where there's a lot of open discussions that occur and facilitated discussions that occur uh, where you're working in collaboration with a really diverse group of people to help answer questions, but to also know that the community is always the expert in terms of what issues are most important for them and what the, what, what the biggest issues are and how to go about them. Um, so, you know, there, there are some, some basic things that we need to acknowledge, especially when working with underprivileged communities. Uh, that's, that's where our, our focus is. And there, these are places that don't have a lot of resources in certain respects. They're very wealthy in, in terms of their social capital, in terms of their knowledge, but mm -hmm. they lack their resources or, politic, or the political influence necessary to make certain changes. And that has to be taken into account when you're engaging a community, certain communities 
first you have to undertake a process yeah. of political let, action actually, and political let, let, let me ask you, not to interrupt you, but I wanted to, you talked about sort of how, uh, of course, working with communities is very local and getting community representation is local, yet also you need that inter interconnectedness and that sort of building the power of political movements. And it's a, it's a bit off topic and we have about five minutes left, but I'd like to ask um, both of you about um, just because of the, the Dakota Access Pipeline issue was such an incredibly um, uh, high, uh, um, high visibility issue now. And it really is about um, environmental justice groups, indigenous justice groups, um, you know, coming to the fore. And it seems like more people are coming to join to work together with those groups than ever before. So I wanted to ask you, Arash, and then also mm -hmm. you, Sean, on your thoughts and experiences in terms of you know, what is going on here with folks coming together for, on this issue? And what does it mean for, for in your case, um, you know, environmental justice and climate justice? You comment and then kick it over to Sean, but I, I, I'm happy that you asked that because I think it's very critical that we understand our shared struggle. This is a shared struggle. And when you, when you research what's actually going on with these projects, you see that there's a pattern that exists many of the same public institutions, many of the same private institutions, whether they're banks or fossil fuel companies or what have you, are responsible for a lot of the extraction of fossil fuels and a lot of the pollution that exists. And I think we have to be united in order to address these issues. If we're not united, it's very easy to divide people, especially if they lack resources. And if you divide people, then you can do anything you want and, and nobody will hold you accountable. So yeah, I think we have to be right. united to hold these people accountable. Thank you so much. And Sean, is this something that students here and, and others in your experience have been following and have been impassioned about as well? Yeah, I think I, I certainly was following it and, and looking to it as, um, you know, we, you kind of have these moments where you feel like, you know, um, the, as the attention is brought to it, we saw this with Occupy Wall, Wall Street, and I think we're seeing this here. We saw, in Hawaii, we saw this with the um, telescope um, resistance, um, pr you know, protectors, as they called it. And I think there is a shared um, feeling that, you know, indigenous people and, and possibly, you know, you know, disadvantaged people in other ways are going through the same thing no matter where you live on the planet. And so I think climate has been a uniter in that way. And, and I think Hawaii people are recognizing that uh, there's no reason we shouldn't be there at the table, too. Uh, well, thank you for that. I, I think that's incredibly interesting. And it's, um, there are so many ways, even though we're so far away, <laughs> I think there are so many ways that places like New York um, and places like Hawaii really share, um, uh, share a lot of, of progress um, and share are really asking, I guess, similar questions. Um, so thank you both for asking that. So I think that will now lead me to say thank you <laughs> very much, Sean. Yeah. And thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Great. And thank you so much, Araj, for joining us from New York City. Um, yeah. And that brings an end to an, another edition of Power of Hawaii. Thank you so much. Mahalo.